promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of all healing, your sins are forgiven.
rejection you bring forth our salvation. And by the glory of the cross you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel we may turn from the lore of evil. Take up our cross and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know to sustain and a weary with a word. Morning by morning, he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled, pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spirit. The Lord God helped me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Not, not, therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near, who will contend with me. Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who will help me, who will declare me guilty. Here ends the first. Continue with Psalm 116, read responsively. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. The Lord has given me to The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over these sins. I am sorry of them, God save me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land. Today's second reading comes from James 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with great strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a smaller member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of inequity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, as restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, 
and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and, and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought to not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish waters? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Here ends the second reading. someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? And I'm going to try and take them one by one this morning. There's a lot in this passage, after all. My Bible has the heading, Peter's Confession of Faith. But it seems like a lot more than that happens. After all, Jesus declares, get behind me, Satan. After Peter rebukes him, Jesus gives seemingly paradoxical advice about living. He asks questions about our priorities. But if you're Peter, I bet you like Peter's confession of faith more than Peter gets it wrong. Jesus calls Peter Satan. So Jesus starts, who do people say that I am? That seems like a reasonable question. Mark's gospel is 16 chapters, so we're halfway through. And Jesus is taking an account of his perception. And Mark's doing the same. He's asking his readers, well, probably listeners in the ancient world, but he's asking the same question. You're this far in the story. What do people say about Jesus? 
What have you heard? Does he have a good reputation? Is he a little weird? Because both Elijah and John the Baptist, who are identifying, who people are identifying Jesus as, are both a little weird. In one story, Elijah has predicted that King Ahaziah will die. The king asks his court, who made this prediction? And they say, well, we don't know his name, but he was a really hairy man, and he had a leather belt around his waist. And the king says, ah, yes, that's Elijah the Tishbite. That's when you know you're a hairy guy. John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey, and that's just as odd then as it is now. That's not one of those weird cultural things that changes over time. It's just strange. And people are seeing Jesus as someone from the past, someone they recognize. They're fitting him into certain categories. Oh, Jesus is like those guys. So Jesus asks his disciples almost the same question. As he doesn't ask, and who do you say that I am? But rather, but who do you say that I am? Not and, but. It's as if Jesus is saying, forget all of that outside noise. Forget what others say. I want to hear from you. Who am I? And Jesus answers rightly like the heading notes. But Peter answers rightly like the heading notes. And just like Jesus' first question, Mark wants us to answer this too. Who is Jesus to you? Today? Right now? At this point in the story? At this point in your life? At this point in Seth's sermon, and if we're going to say that Jesus is the Messiah, we better have the whole story, unlike Peter. Because Peter rebukes Jesus right when he's talking about suffering and rejection and being killed. And Jesus says he will rise up in three days, but I imagine it's hard to hear that after all the other negatives that Jesus just rattled off. So Peter sees Jesus as the Messiah, but only as a conquering one. And there's a lot more to Jesus than that. We get a glimpse of it in the story that comes right before this one. It's only three verses, so I'm just going to read it to you. Jesus took a blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Can you see anything? The man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him away to his home, saying, do not even go into the village. It's another odd story. That's a little bit of a theme today. No wonder Pastor Brody wanted off this Sunday. <laughs> but like Peter, the man can see, but only part way. He can see some of the picture, but not the whole. Just like Peter can see that Jesus is the Messiah, but not that he must undergo great suffering. And that's how we get to our next questions, which are about living as people who see Jesus as the Messiah, complete with all his glory and all the glory suffering. What do we do with this Messiah? We have to follow Jesus in his suffering. This isn't popular. It's the opposite of what scholars have called the prosperity gospel. 
that promises success and financial security, comfort, it's not even attractive to Peter. But according to Jesus, it's what a real life looks like. It's a life characterized not by unbridled success, but by an unburdened soul. Not big bank account balances, but burning love. Not cushy vacations, but Christ-centered community. That's what life looks like in response to Jesus being the Messiah, who must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. That's a life worth living. For what will it profit someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? What's the point of success if it eats you alive inside? Money if you're never really satisfied. Food if you never feel full. Or beach vacations if you think you're such a big shot that you're even bigger than the ocean. Or a cabin retreat if you can't see the beauty that's around you because you're too focused on yourself. So we come to our final question. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? You can't buy what Jesus offers. It's like the great theologian Huey Lewis saying, You don't need money. Don't take fame. Don't need no credit card to ride this train. It's strong and it's sudden and it's cruel sometimes, but it might just save your life. That's the power of love. This love-filled life Jesus offers is not something we can buy or we can achieve, but it's a gift that surpasses everything that we can have in this world. So there are four questions who do people say that I am? But who do you say that I am? What will it profit someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Four questions that Jesus begs us to answer, because he knows the answers already. Jesus knows you, who people say you are, how they talk about you, how you're perceived at work or at school, what people think about you when they see you in line at the grocery store, or when they miss you altogether. But Jesus also knows who people say he is. It's not just in the ancient world that people said he was Elijah or John the Baptist. Today, too, people will say that Jesus is just a prophet. He's just a really smart guy with some pithy sayings. Some people say that his teachings have moral worth. There's nothing more to his story. And of course, some see him as the Messiah, the one who will take up what the prophets from the past started and complete it for eternity. And Jesus knows who he is. It's why he rebukes Peter, he knows that he's a mess of contradictions and is difficult to understand. He's God after all. As one theologian said, if you think you've grasped God, it's not God you've grasped. But Jesus' sense of identity drives him toward Jerusalem. Despite all the suffering that's awaiting him there, He's been tempted in the wilderness. He's been offered all the trappings of the world. He denied it. He's given his life. Literally. He's picked up his cross and carried it. Literally. For you. There's only one way to give back with a life spent picking up our crosses too, losing our lives and finding in the process a life saved by the Savior, Jesus Christ. So may our lives be the answer to Jesus' questions. Amen.
Christians around the world and in the Church Triumphant, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of the I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the Church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. We pray for the Church throughout the world. Form us in the communities of forgiveness and grace. Help us to notice where you are calling us into new relationships, and give us courage to embrace the uncomfortable and unfamiliar. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for the earth and all of its inhabitants. Protect lands at risk of wildfire and here dying forests. For fire brings destruction, raise up new growth. Guide us in tending precarious ecosystems. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for those who govern nations, tribes, and cities. Open them to the cries of people in need. Direct them in shaping policies that prioritize the health and well being of all who struggle with hunger and housing insecurity. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for all who are ill, all who are lonely or anxious, and all who grieve, especially those on prayer list. Draw them close to you and soothe them with the promise of your enduring love. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for teachers, professors, librarians, school, administrators, staff, and all who support the education of young people. Sustain them as they shape learning communities rooted in equity. And authenticity. We pray for children of all ages in their learning. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We remember our beloved dead, who with a great cloud of witnesses bear witness to your saving grace. Accompany us in our pilgrimage of faith, that we too place our hope and trust in you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, Holy God. In the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you.
Jesus called us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 And be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.